Dear friends, welcome back to Open Heart Conversations. I'm Reverend Dr. Jose Miguel Roman, Spiritual Counsel at the United Palace of Spiritual Arts. And today we will have the opportunity to explore the Baha'i Faith. And I am extremely fortunate that I will be joined by the Chief Operating Officer of the United Palace of Spiritual Arts, my friend, brother, and mentor, Reverend Robert Way. Reverend Rob, welcome back to Open Heart Conversations. Thank you, great to be here. And Reverend Rob and I are very fortunate to have a uh, wonderful guest who will help us explore the Baha'i faith, Jay Tyson. Jay, welcome back. It's good to be here, thank you. Excellent. Welcome. We, um, let me tell you a little bit about Jay. Jay grew up outside of Detroit, Michigan uh, and uh, graduated from Princeton University with a degree in civil engineering in 1976. Shortly thereafter, he married. He and his wife spent four years in Liberia, where Jay uh, worked on road construction projects. And um, they also spent seven years in Haifa, Israel, where Jay assisted with the historic restoration at the Baha'i World Center. Raised in a Presbyterian household, Jay was apt from a very early age to deeply ponder spiritual matters. The suicides of three men in his upper middle class neighborhood over the course of a few years caused Jay to question the idea that material success holds the key to a happy life. This led Jay to become a member of the Baha'i faith in 1970. He has since long observed a daily discipline of reading scriptures or books on religion and religious history as part of his own spiritual evolution. Jay has written a book series entitled The Wise Men of the West, A Search for the Promised One in the Latter Days. Jay, we'll begin really with uh, an open question. What, um, how did you become a member of the Baha'i Faith? Well, uh, as I was growing up in the Presbyterian Church, I listened, of course, to the stories of the early messengers of God. You know, you have the story of uh, Noah and the story of Abraham, the story of Moses and then Jesus. But I always wondered why it seemed like God stopped sending messengers to us 2,000 years ago. Uh, I was always curious about that. And uh, why didn't he speak to us again? So when I was a member of the youth group, uh, our minister felt that we should know about other religions. And in connection with that, he took us to uh, some of the other uh, houses of worship in the Detroit area. And it so happened that a member of the Baha'i faith uh, had contacted the ministers in the area and offered to serve as a speaker. Uh, so he invited the Baha'i to speak. And uh, I learned from him that, uh, yes, there was certainly uh, one more recent messenger that history knows about. That, of course, is Muhammad. We didn't learn much about Muhammad uh, where I was growing up. Uh, but this person also explained that in the 1800s, another messenger had appeared, and uh, his name was Baha'u'llah. So I started to uh, do some research on it, uh, attended some of their meetings and learned about it, um, and it just made a lot of sense. I, I knew from uh, the Bible readings that Jesus had spoken that uh, he would come again sometime in the future, but that he would come with a new name. So I was somewhat prepared for the idea that uh, his return might be uh, not uh, a physical or literal return, but the return of the same spirit in a new human form. Uh, so that's uh, how my uh, studies of the Baha'i Faith began and uh, carried on from there until I decided to become a Baha'i and uh, embrace not only Christianity, but uh, the other religions of the world. So Jay, what, what does the, the word Baha'i mean? 
So Baha'i is a um, word that means the all glorious, uh, or more exactly means of the glory. Uh, the glory refers to the glory of God. And that was a title uh, for Mirza Hussein Ali, who is known to history as Baha'u'llah. Baha means glory, Ula is of God. Jay, one of the, um, the most interesting elements to many of the world's enduring uh, spiritual traditions is, in fact, as you've said, um, these men and women who are voices, if you will, of the divine. Um, um, and there's all kinds of what names, everything from saviors to prophets to messengers. Um, and certainly the Baha'i faith um, contains um, its own, uh, if you will, messengers and teachers. And one of, one of these is the Bab. Tell us a little bit about who was the Bab, and in fact, what does the Bab mean? Okay, the, the name Bab is an Arabic word for gate, and uh, he is uh, kind of the forerunner of the Baha'i faith. He appeared uh, in 1844, uh, a little bit like John the Baptist, except that Baha'is understand that he was a full messenger of God, uh, like the others, but had a special short duration mission, which was to prepare the people for the coming of Baha'u'llah. Um, <clears throat> and um, we have then really two messengers in the Baha'i faith, the Bab and Baha'u'llah. Uh, the followers of the Bab, uh, they, you know, this was in Iran at the time, a very, very uh, conservative, uh, religiously conservative part of the world, uh, a lot of resistance to any change. And so his coming kind of uh, broke the mold. And uh, there were over 100,000 followers in Iran. The Bab himself was executed because of his teachings died uh, in a firing squad. Um, and uh, then a few, a couple of years after that, the Holy Spirit started to flow through Baha'u'llah and the revelations continued through him. So we think of the Bob as the forerunner. Um, we have twin messengers of God. And uh, we also celebrate the twin birthdays because uh, it so happens that the Bob was born on the first day of the uh, lunar year, and Baha'u'llah was born two years later on the second day. So one of the Baha'i holy days is that we celebrate their two birthdays together. So to that end, are there any other uh, major figures or teachers of the Baha'i faith? So. After, or as Baha'u'llah was getting to the end of his life, he wrote his will and testament, and he explained that all of the followers should turn for any questions, uh, they should turn to the authority of Baha'u'llah's son, Abdul Baha. Abdul Baha had been with Baha'u'llah during his imprisonments and exiles from 1852 until 1892, so for 40 years. Abdul Baha had uh, plenty of opportunity, really exposure to everything that was going on. Um, and he was uh, well equipped to uh, lead the Baha'i faith after Baha'u'llah's ascension. Uh, Abdul Baha continued to teach. He, he uh, started to spread the Baha'i faith in the West. Uh, he continued until 1921. And in his will and testament, he appointed his grandson, Shoghi Effendi as the guardian of the Baha'i faith. Now, Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha and Shoghi Effendi, all three of them uh, wrote of the establishment of the Universal House of Justice, which would be an elected body, elected by the Baha'is of the world. Um, and so they worked on spreading the Baha'i faith until uh, that international election could take place. That, that finally took place in 1963 for the first time. And ever since 1963, the Baha'is of the world have been guided by the decisions of the Universal House of Justice. So these are the four uh, sources of authority, you can say, and 
because it's been so clear in each transition, uh, the Baha'i faith has managed to remain one united religion. We don't have divisions or you know factions within the Baha'i faith. The transitions have always been very clear. Um, Jay, one of the um, features of many of the enduring uh, spiritual traditions is either a written or oral tradition, uh, written scriptures or oral tradition uh, that um, satisfy the, uh, the requirements of written scripture. And that's certainly true of the Baha'i faith. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about your um, sacred scripture that, and please correct my, my pronunciation, I think, I think it's called the kitab e Akedas or the Akedas. Uh, Kitabi Akdas is how it's pronounced. Kitabi the is, Akdas. Yes, the Q is like a K, and Kitab means book. So Kitabi Akdas uh, is the book of Baha'i laws. Um, in regard to laws, I guess one could say it is the central book, but there are many more subjects besides laws that one finds in the Baha'i revelation. Uh, so... <clears throat> Most religions have several books, and sometimes they're compiled into a single volume, such as the Bible. You know, the Bible is not actually one book, it's several books all compiled together. Uh, in the same way, there are many books in the Baha'i faith. Uh, Baha'u'llah's ministry lasted for 40 years, so he had, you know, a long opportunity to write books and letters. Uh, it's very voluminous. And uh, we have not ever attempted to compile that into a single volume. It would be too large, I think, to manage. Uh, <clears throat> so we, these, these individual books, uh, Kitabi Akdas, uh, like you say, is the book of Baha'i laws. Uh, <clears throat> but we have, uh, for instance, I think one of the leading books on Baha'i theology is called the Kitabi Igan, or the Book of Certitude in which Baha'u'llah explains the relationship between his revelation and the revelations of the past, particularly uh, the revelations to Muhammad and to Jesus uh, and, and to the other messengers uh, that uh, are more Western, I guess you could say. <clears throat> uh, so that's the, the Book of Certitude. Um, another very famous book that uh, many people may have come across is something called The Hidden Words, this is a series of uh, spiritual proverbs that uh, are, are provide useful guidance and are regarded as uh, central to Baha'i ethics. Um, and one of the books is called The Seven Valleys, which is a book about the journey of the soul uh, through seven different stages of spiritual growth. Uh, so that's considered one of the mystical books of the Baha'i faith. Baha'u'llah also wrote to the kings and leaders of his time, uh, addressing aspects of his revelation to them. Uh, we have a volume called The Summons of the Lord of Hosts. And this is a compilation of the letters that he wrote to the kings and leaders of religion uh, during his lifetime. Uh, there are many more books beside that, but those are a few of the major ones. Um Let's begin then exploring what some of the um, those beliefs are. What what really was, if you will, the revelation that one finds in these sacred scriptures. Um, and let's begin really, if you will, at the very beginning. What is in fact a Baha'i concept or understanding of God? We understand God as being unknowable in his essence and yet ever present in our lives and we understand him through his qualities. So analogy that's often given is like the rays, uh, like the sunshine. You know, when we talk about, we know the sunshine, we know the heat of the sun, we know the light of the sun. Uh, you don't ever go up to the sun and grab a piece of it and, and bring it home or anything like that. That would be like the essence. But we do know the qualities. So in the same way, God uh, shines spiritual qualities on us, um, and it is part of our purpose in life to learn how to reflect those qualities into this world. Can, can uh, you speak a little bit about what, what are some of those qualities of God? For example, you keep using the phrase, 
him, he? Is God male? Is God female? Uh, what are the qualities of God that you've come to understand or appreciate um, as you've explored and entered into the Baha'i faith? Yeah, God is neither male nor female. It's one of the unfortunate things about the English language is that we don't really have a personal neutral pronoun. I mean, we can sometimes we do speak of God as it, but that sounds rather impersonal. Um, so generally, the pronoun that's used in English is he. However, in the original Persian and Arabic, they don't have he or she in that sense. So they don't have that problem. It's mostly a problem of the English language that, that tends to drive us into that kind of thinking, unfortunately. Um, I mean, God is the uh, creator. Um, the quality of creation, particularly the creation of life, is uh, often associated with the female side of humanity. Um, but God is also the educator um, and um, sometimes the discipliner. So that's sometimes associated with the male side of humanity. Um, you know, we, we can't say that God is either one or the other. He has all aspects. Uh, he, she, it, whatever you'd like to say. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, we, we know him uh, or her through the qualities, and we try to reflect those qualities in our lives. That is really one of the main goals of life, is to better and better reflect the qualities that he has taught us. What? Tell me a little bit about your your experience or, or your relationship to the divine as you understand it. Uh, well, it's um, I think through prayer and meditation, uh, we are asked to say prayers every day. We're uh, recommended to uh, have some prayer and meditation in the morning and the evening. Uh, as well as midday. Uh, <clears throat> and, um, you know, prayer is talking to God. Uh, meditation is listening for a response. Uh, you know, you, you oftentimes a, a thought will come to your mind after prayer and meditation. Um, and I do think that uh, those thoughts come from beyond this world. Thank you, Jay. So what are the three core assertions? So um, if there's any uh, single word that should be associated with the Baha'i faith, it is unity. Um, we recognize the unity of God, or the oneness of God. Um, and stemming directly from that is our recognition of religion as being essentially one. I mean, yes, we have different labels, you know, we talk about Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and so on, but we understand that as being one evolving message from God. So in that sense, uh, one religion, unity of religion. Also, the third uh, of these onenesses is the oneness of mankind. Uh, if you stop and think about it, with one creator necessarily means that one creator created every individual. And we have to live our lives in the knowledge that when we meet another human being, we are talking to a creation of God and uh, not disparage anyone, uh, because that would be disrespectful to God, not only to that person. So, uh, yeah, the three onenesses, one God, one religion, and one mankind, and it leads to teachings such as the elimination of all kinds of prejudice, uh, not only religious prejudice, but also any racial or ethnic prejudices, elimination of national prejudice, age-based prejudice, caste-based prejudice in some parts of the world, or tribal-based prejudice uh, in other parts of the world, uh, gender-based prejudice is uh, oftentimes a problem that people have. So, you know, all of this is a matter of first and foremost, seeing a person as being a creation of God. And everything else is, you know, kind of the icing on the cake, the special details, but um, all those special details have to be seen in relationship to the, the center part that this person is a creation of God. Uh, and so from, from the central theme of unity, there are other uh, teachings that uh, come forth. Uh, the unity of mankind implies the, that it is time for us to unite 
the contending nations of the world. Uh, Baha'is look forward to a time when the national governments will form into some kind of a federation and uh, we will no longer need to worry about war between nations in the same way that we don't worry about war between the states and the United States. Uh, you have a, a federation here in the United States. We see the future as being a federation for the world. Uh, another aspect of unity is that we believe in the unity of science and religion, that uh, true science and true religion agree with each other. And that if you hold to a rigid literalist interpretation of religion, um, or if you hold to a materialistic view of science, it's going to drive apart the uh, understandings of religion and science. So we try to avoid those, uh, understand them, and work, work with them together. Uh, and finally, another aspect of the unity is the equality of men and women uh, that uh, pervades throughout the Baha'i teachings. So in, in light of these three onenesses, and I think you've already begun to, to speak to this, but what is in fact the fundamental purpose of human life as understood in Baha'i theology and philosophy? Uh, I would say that the fundamental purpose is to know God and to worship Him, and we worship Him by reflecting His qualities into this world. Uh, you know, I mean, prayer, you know, we typically you talk about worship God, people think, okay, you're, you're praying, something like that. But it's not just pious prayer. You've got to take those attitudes out to your day-to-day -day life. Um, we have one of the teachings in the Baha'i Faith is that work done in the spirit of service to humanity is worship. So you need to take the spiritual attitudes into your daily work life, into your daily family life, and uh, try to constantly reflect those attitudes uh, to those around you. And so and I think it's also important to recognize that this is not only for the benefit of uh, life in this world, but it's also for our spiritual development in preparation for the next world. Uh, we believe as well that part of our purpose is to carry forward an ever advancing civilization. So we see you know, civilization as uh, intended by God to be making progress toward greater degree of unity and a better reflection of his qualities in the world. Uh, I think in Christianity, we speak about building the kingdom of heaven on earth. And this is what Baha'is are doing. Cool. Are there any commandments or ethics in Baha'i theology? Um, well, the first commandment is simply to recognize the messengers of God. And uh, Baha'u'llah says in the opening of uh, the Book of Laws, the second commandment is, uh, is to obey what the messengers have said. So uh, I know sometimes uh, I've heard religious folks have a debate between whether um, it's a question of faith or works, you know, whether uh, faith is all you need or whether you need to do works or works alone is enough. Uh, Baha'u'llah makes it very clear that both are required and that neither is acceptable without the other. Uh, <clears throat> so um, as far as ethics, uh, we certainly believe in the golden rule. Um, there are, of, co of course, laws uh, that are similar to those of past religions. We have uh, uh, prayer requirements. We have some fasting, a fasting period, uh, laws of marriage and burial, uh, giving to the poor. One of the interesting laws that I found out about the Baha'i Faith is that um, when it comes to donating money, uh, money is accepted only from Baha'is. If you're not a Baha'i, you cannot make a donation to the Baha'i faith. So uh, you don't have to worry if you go into a Baha'i meeting that somebody's going to be passing the plate and asking for money and that sort of thing, because that's not going to happen. Um, I'm just trying to think also of some new laws uh, for this age. Uh, one is the universal education of children. Uh, 
uh, although that was perhaps implicit in some of the previous religions. Uh, it's spelled out uh, in, in this age that all children must receive an education. And this, again, is for them to be able to grow spiritually and read um, the writings and understand their purpose in life. Um, so that's, that's a relatively new law as such. Another law that I, I don't think I've ever seen, at least not explicitly in past religions, is that we're forbidden to gossip or backbite. Um, so uh, that element of disunity has been uh, uh, obliterated by law in the Baha'i faith. Fascinating. So um, <clears throat> given the purpose of, of human life and given these um, ethical teachings, um, one, of, one of the great um, enduring truths of many of uh, the great enduring traditions, uh, wisdom traditions, is some understanding of what people would call the afterlife. So what, what is the Baha'i understanding of the afterlife? Is there, for example, such a thing as a soul, an individual human soul that survives the uh, death of the body? And what does life after life, if you will, what does that look like, if at all, if there's any mention of that in Baha'i theology? Yeah, yeah, there is certainly a, a lot of uh, discussion of that in Baha'i theology that uh, we, you know, in this world, uh, this is just the first stage uh, of our lives. And uh, after our bodies get old and pass away, our soul continues in the next world. Um, an analogy that's sometimes given is the analogy of the child in the mother's womb. In some sense, you could think of that as being the first world. And during those nine months, the child is preparing for life in this world. You know, it's growing arms and legs and ears and eyes and other organs that are perhaps not so useful in that nine-month world of the womb, but it needs to do that in order to prepare for life in this world. And in the same way, we need to develop our spiritual capacities in this world in order to be prepared for life in the next world. Um, so that, that's maybe obvious to people of a religious background, but uh, maybe not, I don't know. I would say that um, one of the main differences between the Baha'i concept of the afterlife and uh, many of the previous religions is that um, heaven and hell are regarded as uh, spiritual conditions of closeness to God or distance from God but they are not two completely distinct uh, places that are forever separated from each other. Rather, there's a whole continuum of getting closer and closer to God um, through the efforts that we make, uh, particularly in this world, and through the prayers of others. So it's not like you're you know, stuck in one position or the other forever. Uh, <clears throat> As I said, though, we do feel that it's important in this world to grow spiritually because some of the opportunities that we have to grow spiritually in this world will not occur in the next world. Just like the child in the mother's womb, you know, if the child decides not to grow its arms, it's still going to live in this world, but it's going to have a much more difficult time. So... We need to take advantage of our opportunities to grow spiritually in this world while we have them, because some of those opportunities will not exist in the next world. So you answered my question about heaven and hell. Interesting. So that existence within your theology. Yeah, yeah it definitely exists, but not, not two distinct places. Um, they are kind of two ends of a spectrum, I guess you could say. Okay, interesting. So <clears throat> let me, because um, you've already mentioned Christianity, um, what, what does the Baha'i Faith teach concerning the, persons, the person of Jesus Christ? Um, we believe, of course, that uh, <clears throat> he was a messenger of God, 
Um, Baha'u'llah in his writings says that he is exalted above the imaginations of anyone on earth. Um, so he was, you know, certainly uh, an exalted spiritual figure more than we can imagine. Uh, a brilliant mirror who reflected the knowledge of God and the qualities of God into this world. And in reflecting those qualities, he laid the foundations for the great Christian civilization. Uh, he taught as much as could be taught to the disciples and followers uh, of that time. Of course, there were they had their own limitations. You may remember a quote where Jesus says, there are many things I have to tell you, but you could not bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you unto all truth. So we understand that as a reference to a future messenger, whether that be Muhammad or Baha'u'llah. Uh, <clears throat> this understanding that, you know, we, we kind of go through almost like grades in school. You don't try to teach calculus to somebody who's uh, in, in third grade or something like that. You have to go step by step. And so Jesus uh, taught wonderful teachings spiritual teachings that, that laid this wonderful foundation, um, some of which, uh, you know, are, are eternal and some of which are particular for that age. Um, and it's because ages change uh, and because we're able to understand more that God sends new messengers from time to time. But to answer your question, yes, we regard Jesus uh, as being exalted above the imaginations of the peoples of the world. Uh, I think what might be a little bit different is that we also regard the founders of the other religions in the same light. Um, I, I guess maybe one way to understand it is that an animal cannot understand what it's like to be a human being. You know, I mean, Yes, they would understand hunger and uh, a few things like that, but uh, you know, animals, the whole concept of reading is something that uh, animals could not imagine. Uh, why, why we're staring at this print and, and you know, getting meanings from this print and this sort of thing. We live in a, in a realm that is entirely different from that of the animal. Um, in the same way that they can't understand what it is like to be a human being, we cannot understand what it is like to be a messenger of God. Because these messengers are not just people who, you know, heard some, some words and some, some message. Um, they are a level of creation above uh, the human level. And um, the, they all understand, you know, the whole picture, but they limit what they teach according to the capacity of the people that they are teaching. You know, like, like a regular teacher in school, the teacher knows way, way more than the student, but the teacher is careful to uh, provide only what the student can understand at that time. Is it true that the Baha'i faith accepts Muhammad as a prophet of God and the Quran as the word of God? Uh, yes, that is true. Um, he was a messenger like Jesus. Uh, he, of course, came to a different people, and so the needs of those people were somewhat different. So there are some, um, some differences uh, in the teachings. Um, <clears throat> but a lot of the differences uh, come about from people's interpretations that uh, mm -hmm. seem to go in different directions rather than from the teachings themselves. Um, unlike the religions which preceded it, Muhammad had the opportunity to uh, review the things that he revealed. In other words, he himself was not literate, but others around him were. He would reveal things. Uh, the Quran is in a poetic form, so people would write down the poetry of the Quran, and then Muhammad would have it read back to him. And he could correct any errors that were made so that they could be sure that uh, this was the actual revelation. Uh, unfortunately, Jesus did not have that opportunity. Jesus' ministry, of course, was cut short by the, the crucifixion. 
uh, and he didn't have people around him uh, in his immediate vicinity that wrote things down on the day that he revealed them. Uh, so the Quran has a kind of special place in religious literature. I believe it's the only historic example prior to the Baha'i faith, the only historic example where the revelation could be reviewed and authenticated by the messenger himself. And Jay, um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but it, uh, you've alluded to this. Uh, in the Baha'i faith, um, it is understood that Moses, Abraham, Zoroaster, and also Buddha, had, that, that, that there, there was a divine nature to their teaching, a divine nature, if you will, to the, to the mission and to their work. Um, so that the Baha'i um, tradition in many ways honors the work, um, the spiritual work of these individuals. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And I would also add uh, Krishna to that list uh, with Hinduism. Um, <clears throat> so some of these messengers go back a little bit farther in history and the you know historical certain, certainty of them is uh, uh, not perfect, but uh, yes, we regard Krishna, Buddha, Zoroaster uh, of the East, uh, Abraham, Moses, uh, Jesus, Muhammad of the West, uh, as being earlier historic messengers of God. Now, it's important also to understand that God did not leave alone the other peoples of the world. Uh, God sent messengers, has, has sent messengers to all peoples. Uh, many of them, probably most of them, uh, appeared before we had written records. And so they wind up, their, their teachings wind up being part of the cultural mythology um, rather than scripture. Uh, but uh, if you go to, you know, do anthropological studies of the peoples, uh, the indigenous peoples of the world, you find that they're, they're always some kind of uh, moral understanding, some understanding that... Uh, they didn't just uh, come into being uh, willy-nilly, but that they, there was a creator. Um, some sense of uh, the golden rule or values. Um, and these, we believe, if you were able to historically trace them back, you would find that they were inspired by a messenger that God had sent to those peoples. Um, Any time that there's a... Uh, a burst of civilization, we believe that uh, there was a spiritual seed that started that growth and that blossoming. And that seed was the teachings of one of these early messengers whose names are, you know, have often been forgotten in, in history, or maybe they have a name, um, but they don't have, you know, written historical records. So, um, yeah, it's kind of uh, important to understand that God didn't forget anybody in the world. It's really interesting. My, my mother used to have a saying uh, that she used to say in Spanish, that God has not denied God's self to anyone in the world who sincerely sought God. And it sounds to me like the Baha'i faith uh, would have agreed with my mom. <laughs> yes, that, that I, I would say that's very accurate. <laughs> <laughs> so... What are the major practices of the Baha'i faith? Um, living the Baha'i life um, includes treating everyone with respect and kindness, uh, raising the next generation of children to live with an understanding of the spiritual reality, not just the material reality, uh, raising them with an understanding of the importance of carrying forward and ever, ever advancing civilization, as I mentioned. Um, on a more practical level, uh, we do get together uh, for community gatherings once every 19 days, which is according to the Baha'i calendar. Uh, the Baha'i calendar is kind of unique. It's made up of uh, 19 months per year, each month having 19 days that comes to 361 days. And then we have four or five days in between a couple of the months to round out the calendar to a full solar year. Um, 
but we do have in, instead of uh, like a church service every week um, we have these gatherings it's sometimes referred to as a Baha'i feast not so much a, a physical feast of food but a spiritual feast where we share readings and uh, uh, share community business have some social portion uh, so that helps to you know it's, it's very much a community oriented religion uh, in addition to that we have devotional gatherings uh, discussion groups and study classes uh, all of those open to the public so um, you know anybody is uh, welcome to participate uh, can get in touch with the Baha'is and find the local community um, on the personal side uh, I think I mentioned uh, daily prayer uh, and a period of fasting uh, we have a period of 19 days in March during which uh, we fast during the daylight hours uh, you know sometimes when I meet people they say wow that's really something uh, most people don't uh, remember the fact that in Christianity in early Christianity um, the Lenten period was 40 days and during that uh, 40 days uh, that was for fasting it was uh, a daytime fast you didn't eat from sunrise to sunset um, and then the Islamic civilization came along and in the Islamic law uh, it was a lunar month so the fasting period uh, went from 40 days it went down to about 29 days uh, and now in the Baha'i faith you find the fasting period is 19 days so it's a little bit easier uh, in that context um, it's uh, and it's always in March so it's uh, not not especially long days uh, like you would have if it was in June or something um, so those are a few of the of the practices Jay, um, one of the central elements of the enduring spiritual and religious traditions is, is the experience of community. Um, in the Christian tradition, there are churches. In the Islamic tradition, mosques. In the Jewish tradition, synagogues. Places of worship where people can come and experience community and experience their faith within a community. Um, does the Baha'i faith have temples of worship and if they if it does what happens in those temples what would a what would a temple worship service in the baha'i faith look like so um yes we do have uh temples we call them houses of worship um at present uh only a few around the world uh the one for north america for instance is in the uh uh, a northern suburb of Chicago, Wilmette, Illinois. Uh, <clears throat> and there's one now on each continent, and we're beginning to develop uh, national and local houses of worship. <clears throat> they have a distinct architectural feature. They're domed buildings. They have nine sides. Um, and they, will, they are the central spiritual focus for larger communities. And the intention is that there will be surrounding them um, several different um, institutions for uh, helping humanity, whether it's a hospice or schools or various uh, social benefits that uh, kind of are focused around the house of worship. Uh, <clears throat> so that's something that is gradually developing as the communities grow larger. In the meantime, for uh, many cities, we have a Baha'i Center, which can take a lot of different forms. Um, sometimes it's just an existing building that the local Baha'i community has purchased and uh, is using for its uh, general meetings. Um, <clears throat> and then in the smaller communities, uh, we meet in people's homes, much as the early Christians did 1800 years ago, you know, when Christianity was young and they they uh, were not uh, large enough to raise large buildings. Um, they met in each other's homes. So uh, this religion is now, it's been about 200 years since the founders were born. Uh, similarly, in Christianity at about that stage, the communities were mostly meeting in each other's homes. Uh, so you'll, you know, if you contact the Baha'i community, uh, you could wind up going to any of these three uh, as to what happens in the temples, um, or the houses of worship, as we usually refer to them, uh, 
Um, they're open on a daily basis to the public, both for visitation and for prayer and meditation. Um, it's generally quiet inside, uh, individual prayer and meditation happening, uh, not, not only for Baha'is, but for the public as well. Um, there are, from time to time, uh, in the houses of worship, there'll be a devotional a program of readings which are drawn not only from the Baha'i scripture, but from the scriptures of the past religions. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on Baha'i holy days, there'll be special services. Um, in addition to readings for the services, we sometimes will have a cappella singing, that is singing without musical instruments, uh, is uh, encouraged in the Baha'i houses of worship. But there are no uh, rituals. I, I guess, uh, you know, sometimes people think of these uh, places as places where you have uh, various rituals. Uh, you generally find that um, there's very little in the way of ritual in the Baha'i faith. So, um, you know, you, you won't really see that by going to a house of worship. Now, in a, to, to just expand on that, in... Christianity, we have, you know, they have the Vatican, you know, in the Muslim traditions, there's Mecca. Um, is there a, a, a central temple or sacred place for the Baha'i faith? Well, yes, there's uh, historically uh, the, Baha well, the Baha'i faith began in Persia uh, because of the persecution the founder was exiled first to Baghdad and then to Constantinople. And then finally he was sent to the prison city of Akka, which at the time was in Palestine. Uh, and the Baha'i World Center has grown up in the cities of Akka and across the bay in Haifa, uh, which of course later became the country of Israel. Uh, we don't have any direct relationship to Israel historically. It just happened that, uh, you know, the... <laughs> Things changed there while we were already there. The Baha'is have been in that part of the world since 1868. Um, <clears throat> but the Baha'i uh, spiritual center is in or immediately outside of Akka, where Baha'u'llah's Baha uh, physical remains were buried after his ascension in 1892. Um, the Bab, uh, the forerunner, as I mentioned earlier, he was executed his followers were able to recover his remains and hid them for many years. And in 1909, they were transported to the Holy Land and they were interred on Mount Carmel um, there in Haifa. Uh, and a shrine was built around them. A lot of times when you uh, look at Baha'i literature, you may see a building with a gold dome. That is the shrine of the Bab. And uh, <clears throat> so that's kind of a spiritual center as well. Uh, the, the Haifa area with the Shrine of the Bab and the Akka area with the Shrine of Baha'u'llah. In addition to that, the Baha'i Administrative Center uh, has been built up there in Haifa. So kind of across the street from the Shrine of the Bab is the seat of the Universal House of Justice the organization that guides the Baha'i world and other administrative bodies, uh, which are set in this beautiful, beautiful garden setting. You have these mo monumental white marble buildings surrounded by gardens. Uh, a lot of people who have visited Israel, if they've gone to the northern part of Israel, they've almost all seen the Baha'i buildings uh, on Mount Carmel there because that's a, a central draw for the, uh, for the tourist industry in northern Israel. <clears throat> and I had the bounty of being able to work there for seven years. Um, as a civil engineer, they needed somebody to assist with the restoration of some of the historic buildings. And so uh, I had the bounty of uh, doing that task from 1982 until 1989. Okay. Reverend Rob, uh, dear brother, I, I think you also had a question regarding clergy. Yes, yeah. So most other enduring uh, faith systems have clergy or hierarchy. How does that uh, represent within the Baha'i faith? 
So this is one thing that's kind of distinctive about the Baha'i faith. Um, we have no clergy because the central role of clergy was regarded as um, teaching people about spiritual reality. Um, but now, if you can teach children how to read and write and you know, impress upon them the importance of study for themselves, then this independent investigation of truth uh, is regarded as being uh, a better step than uh, you know having uh, a clergyman that uh, you know kind of lectures to everybody. Uh, <clears throat> and the traditional functions of clergy uh, have been kind of broken down and divided up uh, so that, for instance, uh, whether it's a matter of uh, visiting members of the community that uh, need some help or teaching the children's classes or teaching adult classes, um, various administrative tasks uh, that can be broken up into smaller pieces and everyone uh, can have a role in uh, one or the other of these tasks. So on the one hand, <clears throat> we might say that there are no clergy in the Baha'i faith. On a, the other hand, uh, you could say maybe that everybody in the Baha'i faith is clergy because uh, everybody is responsible for helping with teaching work, whether it's teaching children or teaching junior youth or youth or, or teaching others who, you know, adults who don't know about the Baha'i faith. Um, so everybody has a role. Um, it's almost never a paid role. Uh, so that also eliminates one of the complications that sometimes occurs when you have a religion and clergy. Um, as far as administration, <clears throat> we do have, uh, in communities that have nine or more adult members, we elect what's called a local spiritual assembly. Uh, those nine members make decisions for the Baha'i community and guide the Baha'i community. <clears throat> Uh, then they come together in, in each country, uh, members come together to vote for a national spiritual assembly and the national spiritual assembly does the same sort of uh, guiding and decision making on a national level and they all operate under the aegis of the Universal House of Justice uh, in the Holy Land. So we do have an administrative order. Um, there's almost you know, the very, very few people who, who uh, have paid positions in that administrative order. It's almost all volunteer work, um, <clears throat> but it does organize and coordinate the Baha'i activities. Jay. And then uh, w one thing I might add is that um, one thing that's a little bit interesting that the decision making process is always by groups, it's not by individuals. So that eliminates a lot of the problems that religions have had in the past when you get somebody whose ego gets the better of him and he's driving in one direction or another direction. Um, because when you make decisions in a consultative uh, group process, uh, it, it tends to take the edges off and uh, I think tends to lead to better decision making. So uh, that's, that's, I think, one unique aspect of the Baha'i faith. You know, sometimes the... Uh, Baha'is, particularly at the World Center, they might get uh, requests from reporters, we want to speak to the leader of the Baha'i faith. And uh, well, there is no one leader person. This is all, everything is by, by groups, whether it's the members of the House of Justice, that's nine people, or the nine members of the National Spiritual Assembly, or locally nine members of the local assembly, um, no one leader. So a um, little bit different in that regard. Jay, many of um, the world's enduring spiritual and religious traditions have very special days that they commemorate and celebrate. An example for ex is uh, the Christian um, holiday of Christmas, for example. In the Buddhist tradition, they, many Buddhists celebrate the, uh, the birth of the Buddha or the death of the Buddha. In the Baha'i faith, are there any holidays that are special and celebrated, any days that are especially commemorated? Yes, we certainly do have our set of holidays, uh, <clears throat> primarily associated with uh, the two messengers, uh, the declaration of the Bab, uh, 
commemorates the time on May 22nd, 23rd, when the Bob first announced that this new revelation had dawned uh, back in, in 1844. Um, so that's yeah, May 22nd, May 23rd. Um, the Declaration of Baha'u'llah, which occurred in 1863, is a 12-day period in April, from April 21st until May 2nd, uh, that commemorates when he announced uh, his revelation. Uh, that is considered the most holy festival. Um, <clears throat> we, I mentioned earlier, we celebrate the twin birthdays. The Bab and Baha'u'llah were born you know, on the first and second day of the lunar year. So those two days are celebrated together each year uh, in the fall. It jumps around a little bit because, it, because it's lunar-based instead of solar-based, but uh, they're celebrated together. Um, and of course, a uh, more somber holiday is the Ascension of Baha'u'llah, which was uh, May 29th, 1892, and the Martyrdom of the Bab, which was July 9th, uh, 1850. So those, uh, those are the main Baha'i holy days. Mm. Also, I might mention that uh, we do have a New Year Day, <clears throat> which, uh, in keeping with the um, Persian tradition, is celebrated on the first day of spring, uh, March 21st. Um, not that, you know, it, wasn't, it doesn't commemorate any particular event, it just commemorates the spring equinox, the, the beginning of the spring season. Uh, and, um, you know, so we, we mark our time from March 21st each year. So what in your tradition do you find most helpful in living your, your life on a day-to-day -day basis? I think for myself, um, living in the knowledge that the promises that can, were contained in the religions of the past, promises that God would send a new messenger in the latter days, uh, to guide us through this difficult transition from a world of separated nations, often at war with each other, to a united world of peace and a kingdom of heaven on earth. Uh, the knowledge that that message has arrived and now simply needs to be implemented uh, is, I think, certainly one of the items that I find most, uh, most wonderful, most comforting as we go through this uh, particularly uh, turbulent uh, period of transition. Hmm. Now, to e e expand on that, does the Baha'i faith uh, or the Bab say anything about another messenger coming? Yes, in fact, Baha'u'llah said that God will not leave mankind alone. Um, he said that after another thousand years or so, um, conditions will have changed sufficiently that God will send another messenger at that time and uh, presumably, you know, continue further into the future as well. Uh, so we see revelation from God as being progressive, not something that is just fixed and final. Um, so, but we have plenty to work on, <laughs> plenty to do before those thousand years are, are up. We have a lot of yeah. uh, exhortations from, from Baha'u'llah uh, as to how we should live both individually and collectively. Um, and once we have, uh, you know, achieved those things, um, yeah, by that time, there should be a world civilization uh, which focuses on uh, advancing uh, both spiritually and materially. And uh, then at that time, uh, another messenger we expect will appear. Hey, um, when, when you look out into the world that we live in right now, we are certainly a world facing many, many, many complex challenges without uh, necessarily becoming um, political, but, but really looking at those challenges from a deeply spiritual perspective. What message do you think the Baha'i faith has um, that could be of real 
benefit to modern humanity as it confronts these challenges? Well, I think certainly the message of unity, the message of uh, recognizing that we are all children of one God and that we have to uh, act in that uh, knowledge, um, the recognition that our life in this world is just a small portion of our larger existence. Um, and, you know, one of the teachings in the Baha'i Baha faith is that we should bring ourselves to account each day. Baha'u'llah says, ere thou art summoned to a reckoning. So is this understanding that, you know, what we do in our lives here, we will be asked about when we get to the next world. And that knowledge alone, I think, helps to guide our steps and guide the actions that we take. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, but yeah, working toward greater unity, you know, we're seeing tremendous division uh, in this country in particular, but even across the world, we seem to see a, a rise of uh, nationalism when uh, the time has come for internationalism. Uh, there seems to be a rise in racial prejudice in this country, uh, religious preju prejudice in some other countries, or tribal prejudice, caste prejudice, uh, I think you hear about often in India. Um, so all of these things, you know, coming about from uh, looking at the material aspect of humanity rather than the spiritual aspect of humanity. Um, and... Uh, as long as we are focused on the material aspect, uh, it will drive things farther and farther apart. We need to turn around and focus on the spiritual aspects. So is there a process that someone has to go through to become a Baha'i? Uh, to be a Baha'i is to recognize that Baha'u'llah is God's messenger for this age and <clears throat> all of that comes along with that, that his teachings then are a re reliable source of truth um, that we must follow. Um, so once you have that recognition, you understand that he revealed some laws, those laws you need to abide by, um, <clears throat> then you are in your heart, you're a Baha'i. Uh, as far as um, administratively, it's simply a matter of registering, signing a card uh, that, you know, you declare that you recognize uh, this, that Baha'u'llah is God's messenger for this day and age. Um, there's very, very little ritual, you know, there's no like baptism or anything like that in the Baha'i faith. So, but... Is it true that you can't become a Baha'i before the age of 18? Um, the age of 15 is considered the age 15. of spiritual mat maturity, yes. So, <clears throat> um, and children in Baha'i families, uh, they, they learn about the Baha'i faith as well as learning about other religions. And then at the age of 15, they must make the choice for themselves as to whether they want to formally join the membership. You're not automatically a Baha'i just because your parents were Baha'is. Uh, you, as a uh, spiritually mature individual at age 15, can either decide to join or not to join, or uh, some will postpone that decision and make the decision later. Uh, you don't have to make it right when you're 15, but um, uh, yeah, the age 15 is considered the age of maturity in that regard. Oh, interesting. Wow. Reverend Rob, I know you also had a question regarding information. Yeah. How could someone get, you know, this has been fascinating. I, you know, th this look, this deeper look into the Baha'i faith, um, we've really scratched the surface. And I thank you so much because for me, it's that I want to I want to go deeper. So, any interested in the Baha'i faith from you know watching the, or listening to this program, how can they get further information? Uh, well, if you want to get in touch with the Baha'i community, the easiest way to do that is probably to call one eight hundred 
two two unite <laughs> is the uh, special number phone number that they have uh, one eight hundred two two unite um, and they will give you contact information for your local Baha'i community, someone that uh, you can call or someone to call you, uh, or you leave them your email address, however you want to do that. Uh, <clears throat> if you want uh, read-only information, you can go to various Baha'i websites, uh, www.baha'i.org, that's B-A-H-A-I, they don't use the apostrophe. Uh, <clears throat> so that uh, will give you uh, information uh, internationally. That's for the whole world. Uh, there's also a www.baha'i.us, which focuses more on Baha'i activities in the United States. Um, the, there's all kinds of Baha'i books available at uh, something called the Baha'i Bookstore, www.baha'ibookstore, all one word, dot com. Uh, so you can get lots of literature there, if, if that's what you're interested in, or Baha'i music as well. Um, one good introductory book is uh, called God Speaks Again by Kenneth Bowers, who's a member of the Baha'i National Assembly of the United States. And uh, if I could just put in a little plug here, um, if you're particularly interested in the relationship between the Baha'i faith and other religions, especially with regard to uh, prophecy, historic uh, religious prophecy, uh, you might be interested in the book that I wrote. Uh, I was mentioned in the beginning in the introduction, The Wise Men of the West is a novel, but it uh, is set in 1844 at a time when people in the West were expecting the return of Christ and um, when it didn't happen the way they expected, it was called the Great Disappointment. You know, there were over 100,000 followers of William Miller uh, who taught that Christ should return in 1844. Uh, they had a very specific idea of the manner of Christ's return, and that clearly did not happen. Uh, but the book that I wrote uh, kind of uh, is it's a novel. What would happen if some people from the West set out looking for the Promised One, much in the way that uh, three Persians set out during the time of Jesus from the East. They were looking for the coming of their Promised One. They were Zoroastrian Persians. You know, Zoroastrians had prophecies about the coming of another manifestation, another messenger of God. And it was those prophecies that led the wise men to the birth of Jesus. So we all remember from the Christmas story, The Wise Men of the East. Uh, my book is kind of a mirror image of that. And thus it's called The Wise Men of the West, set in the 1840s uh, with people on search for the promised one at that time. So uh, <clears throat> that's you know just one book. And uh, I think for those who have an interest in religious prophecy, they might find that uh, well worth reading. Fantastic. Jay, uh, on behalf of the United Palace of Spiritual Arts and certainly the Open Heart Conversations, thank you so very much. This has been a very deep and extremely rich conversation. Uh, we really have enjoyed exploring the Baha'i faith with you. Thank you very, very much. Well, thank you for providing me with the opportunity. I've enjoyed it very much myself. Thank you. And Reverend Rob, thank you, very much. thank you for not only co-hosting this program, but as Chief Operating Officer, providing so much guidance and so much support for the Open Heart Conversations. Love you, sweet brother. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Great. Thank you for having me. And to all our uh, viewers and listeners, thank you once again for being part of Open Heart Conversations. Take care.